I was nine years old when Libby Pa was taken from her bedroom in the middle of the night. Her family lived across the street from us. That night, I was peering through the telescope my father had bought me a few weeks prior to stare at the night sky and the constellations. The light pollution from the city made it hard to see the stars with the naked eye. But after three weeks of peering through the eyepiece, I had found a few constellations that were marked in the star chart that had come with the gift. I looked from the eyepiece for half a second and I noticed a dark figure moving towards the side of Libby's house. It looked like an impossibly large man crawling on all fours. I couldn't make out any features, but I watched as he reached his massive arm through her window and effortlessly pushed through the glass and pulled her out in one fluid motion. Libby was kicking and screaming. As I let out a shriek and I shot it for my father. It was hard to make out what the man was doing as he pulled Libby into the darkness beside her house, but I could almost swear that he was looking right at me. And my father came into the room and after calming me down enough to get a coherent answer, he called the police. I told the police everything that I had just told you. My father and the local authorities treated my statement as being the wild imagination of a scared child, but I know what I saw. For the next week, Libby's parents were all over the news asking for the return of their daughter. The media uproar only intensified a week later when Alice Evans was abducted from her bedroom in a similar manner. In the winter of 1991, seven young girls were abducted from their bedrooms in my neighborhood. I wasn't the only person that had reported the impossibly large man, but if anybody had actually bothered to listen to these reports, they weren't being covered by the local news. By March of 1991, the police had announced that they had found all seven bodies in the nearby abandoned Head Start building on Ingram Street. No suspects had been identified. It wasn't too long before the rumor started up on the playground at school. All seven of the girls had been so mangled, the families were forced into a closed casket funeral. My little brother Alan was especially scared. Alice Evans was his girlfriend. They had met in kindergarten and were one of those couples of young children that held hands everywhere they went. When it was confirmed that Alice was dead, he stopped talking. It was a tragedy that turned into a cold case that turned into a trial of a decade when the police had come forward to announce that they had arrested William Billy Stout for the murder of all seven girls. All of the neighborhood kids knew Billy Stout. Billy was born with homocystinuria. Despite being more than 7 feet tall and nearly 20 years old, Billy had the mind of a child. It wasn't uncommon for his parents to bring him to the playground later in the day, when most of the younger kids had run home for the day. It was revealed during the trial that one of Billy's shirts and a pair of his shoes had blood on them matching Libby's blood type. And DNA testing wasn't really a thing back then. With this connection to Libby's death and the reports of an impossibly large suspect, it wasn't long until the jury returned a guilty verdict and sentenced Billy to death. I knew Billy. I had even traded baseball cards with him on more than one occasion. I knew what Billy looked like. When I started telling people that I had seen the guy who grabbed Libby and that he was much larger than Billy, I was either ignored or told that I was telling tall tales. In the spring of 1994, my dad moved us to a house about a mile away from our old neighborhood. Alan had to withdraw from school. Not only had he stopped talking, but he had also started lashing out at anybody who tried to talk to him. The head shrinkers up at the hospital had put him on a series of pills that left him staring out the windows most days. Dad had to hire a full-time caretaker for him. Three years after Libby's abduction and Billy's trial, I was still convinced that there was some giant monster out there stealing kids. I had probably read every book in the local library on ghosts, monsters, and serial killers. I was in 7th grade and most of the kids had started calling me spooky. Despite being the weird kid that everybody thought was a devil worshipper or some sort of freak, I had made a few friends. Stephanie Powell shared my opinion on Billy Stout. She had been in the room when her twin sister was snatched from the window. She had a sketchbook filled with drawings of the dark figure that had taken her other half. She and I had started spending time together in 5th grade, and by junior high, we were pretty much best friends. She introduced me to Deontay Jackson, and Deontay had lost his little sister as well. The three of us ate near the back of the cafeteria, 
we spent most of our time after school at the library. Deontay and I lived a few blocks from each other. Stephanie still lived across the street from my old house. Each day at around 6 or 7 in the evening, Deontay and I would walk Stephanie home before walking the mile or so to my new neighborhood. It was somewhere around early May when he stopped in the middle of the sidewalk and he said, Hey Spooky, look. He was pointing at a small patch of trees and brush to the side of a house on the corner. At first, I could not make out what he was pointing at. The sun was already low in the sky and behind us. Deontay pointed at the patch of trees and just as he darted past me, I caught sight of a shadowy figure standing just inside the small wooded area. It must have been at least 10 feet tall. As Deontay ran past me, the dark figure dropped onto all fours and ran across the street into an alley. I followed him as he chased the shadowy man through the dark alley. He must have walked down the street a few hundred times and he never noticed that alley before. It was long and narrow. There were chain link fences and garages on either side of us. As we dodged trash cans and tried to catch up to something that has already disappeared in the darkness we were quickly approaching at the end of the narrow path. At the end of the alley was a near, monolithic stone wall. It must have been 20 feet tall. On either side was a similar stone wall that stood nearly as tall stretching nearly 40 feet back. As we stood in the alley, barely wide enough for a small car, we turned to see an impossibly large man, standing between us and the last bit of sun dropping below the horizon. The contrast of the orange-red sun against his near pitch black skin showed exactly how large he really was. His eyes were a deep blue, and his mouth had opened to show near perfect white teeth that looked as if they had been sharpened into tiny daggers. Deontay and I realized very quickly that this thing wasn't running from us. It was baiting us into following it. Each step it took toward us was slow and deliberate. Our backs were against the wall. The dark man lowered his face to the point that he was staring directly into my eyes. His tongue extended and I started crying as he licked my cheek. His expression turned to one of frustration before he turned towards Deontay and sniffed his chest. The creature recoiled, seemingly in disgust. Before planting one foot on the concrete wall to my left and proceeded to climb over the concrete wall and into the darkness behind it. We didn't wait to see if it would return. The two of us ran out of the alley and back to my house without looking back once. My dad was working late and Becky, Alan's caretaker, had been nice enough to hand us a couple of sodas from the fridge. As we spent the rest of the evening trying to make sense of what we had seen while taking turns talking to Stephanie on the phone. By the time my dad had come home, Deontay and I had passed onto the floor of the living room. On Saturday morning, the three of us waited until the sun was high in the sky before making our way to that alley. Unbeknownst to the other two, I had taken a small pistol and an extra magazine from my father's gun cabinet. We turned into the alley to the right of the patch of trees and quickly came to realize that it led out into the street on the other side of the block. We walked up and down the alley three or four times before scouring the rest of the neighborhood, looking to see if we could find anything like the stone hallway the dark man had cornered us in. Nothing. Unable to return to the end of the alley, we turned our attention to the small patch of trees where we had originally seen the creature. Just past the tree line, we found a raised mound of dirt that seemed to be hiding a five and a half foot wide hole in the ground. I was not about to climb down into it and I don't think either of the others were so inclined. Instead, I threw a rock into the hole. I heard it bounce off the sides a few times before making a sound like it had plopped into a pool of water. And Deontay said, Over your eyes, Steph. This thing took Andrea and I'm gonna piss on it. Stephanie turned away as he proceeded to take a leak directly into the mouth of the hole. Just like with the rock, we heard the piss hitting what sounded like water at the bottom. However, no sooner than Deontay had zipped his pants, we heard a bellowing roar come from somewhere deep in the chasm followed by loud scraping sounds. We bolted and just as we cleared the edge of the trees, I looked back to see a pitch black arm with a massive black hand swipe in our general direction. We had found its lair. You'd think that we would have found a way to plug the hole or convince some adults to do something about it. But three years of trying to convince people that the Dark Man existed in the first place had taught us that no one was going to believe us. Instead of trying our hand at splunking, 
We went back to the library and spent the rest of the day looking for anything we could find that would tell us more about the Dark Man. I spent most of the afternoon in the paranormal section of the adult library. I sat at a table flipping through books on ghosts, cryptids, and various local legends. Deontay and Stephanie had disappeared at some point and left me to my reading. I had become used to the idea that they had probably slipped into a reading room or something to make out. They had been dating for a few months at that point. The librarian walked up to my table and said, Francis, we're going to be closing up in a few. You might want to head home. The library closed early on Saturday. I stepped outside to see Deontay and Stephanie sitting snuggled up next to each other on a bench, listening to Stephanie's Walkman and sharing the headphones. It was 6 in the afternoon and the sun was still fairly high in the sky, but we were more than 2 miles away from home and the bus had stopped running a few minutes prior. I had an uneasy feeling about walking home. I turned to Stephanie and said, Do you think we should call your parents to come pick us up? Stephanie shook her head before saying, My dad hates Deontay. I had just as soon called the police and told them that I stole something. Deontay laughed and said, Yeah, the dude hates me, but we can call my cousin Q. We walked to a nearby payphone and I dropped a quarter in the slot as Deontay picked up the receiver and called Q. A few minutes later, a teenager in a station wagon pulled up and said, Yo Deontay, who's your chick? Deontay punched me in the arm and he said, Oh, you mean Spooky here? Nah, he's a guy, I think. Q laughed and said, Stop clowning, dude. Where am I taking you? I climbed into the front seat with Q and Deontay climbed into the back seat with Stephanie. Q was Deontay's older cousin. He lived with Deontay and their grandmother not too far from my place. I reached into my bag and I pulled out my water bottle. And Q tapped me on the shoulder whispering, Yo kid, why are you packing heat? I looked down in the bag and saw that the pistol was in plain view. I turned to Q and I said, Man, you don't want to know. We pulled into Q's driveway and he turned around to say, D, go introduce Grams to your girl. I'm going to talk with Spooky for a bit. Deontay and Stephanie headed inside. Alright little man, why are you running around with that pistol? Q asked in a concerned tone. I stared out of the window and I replied, Do you know why they call me Spooky? Q replied, yeah, because you're always going on and on about ghosts and shit. I laughed uncomfortably and then I said, No, it's because that I watched the thing that stole Dee's sister grab Lippy Powell. It wasn't Billy Stout. Q's tone changed to one of anger and he raised his voice slightly and said, Don't be putting any of that ghost story shit on Andrea. I hope that retard burns in hell for what he did. I turned to Q and I stared directly into his eyes and I said, the thing looks like a man, but his skin is as black as midnight and he stands almost 10 feet tall. You think I'm messing around? Asked Deontay. He saw it too. Q visibly shuddered and he said, I can see why they call you spooky. I continued, We know where that thing is and as soon as I see it again, I'm going to shoot it. Don't tell D or Steph either. They don't know about my dad's gun and I'm not telling them. Q pulled a cigarette from a pack in his shirt pocket and offered it to me saying, You smoke? I lied and said, Sure. He lit the cigarette and handed it to me before lighting one for himself. Thirteen years of living with an indoor smoker and I didn't even cough when I first inhaled the cool menthol of the cigarette. By the second drag I was already feeling kind of dizzy, but I liked it. I smoked the cigarette and I stared out of the windshield in silence as Q and I shared that moment. After nearly five minutes of silence, Q said, You should talk to my grams about that tall dark dude. It sounds like a story that she used to tell us. I got out of the car and went inside to see that Deontay's grandmother had already set out a feast for us. Stephanie and Grams were chatting with each other about Deontay as Q came in behind me. Graham said, I can smell that smoke on you, Quentin Marcus Jackson. You better wash your hands before you touch this food. I joined him at the sink and I washed my hands as well. I didn't want to risk getting on her bad side. Q pulled up a chair and Deontay said grace as we all sat around the table. 
and Stephanie had called her parents saying that she was at my house. My dad probably wouldn't be home in time to notice that I stayed out late. We ate and talked over dinner until Grams told Q to take Stephanie home and sent Deontay upstairs to shower and get ready for bed. I helped her clear the table as she said. So, what were you talking to Q about outside? He looked like he had seen a ghost. I didn't answer. Gramps put the last dish from the table up on the counter before saying, You shouldn't be running around this town at night. It's dangerous out there. I laughed and said, You have no idea. Gramps got a look on her face that was halfway between stern and afraid when she said, Try me, kid. For the next hour, I told her about Libby, the dark man, the end of the alley that wasn't really there and how we had found a hole it seemed to be hiding in. Grams didn't say much, but she also wasn't telling me I was crazy or making things up. It was nice to have an adult that was actually listening to me for once. As Grams sat there and I listened, Deontay came downstairs in his pajamas and posted up next to his grandmother. She turned to her grandson and said, So, y'all ran into him, huh? Deontay nodded and Grams reached into her purse and pulled out a small metal flask. After taking a swig, she coughed and said, You all need to listen close. It might save your life. When I was about Q's age, everybody was upset about Russians dropping atom bombs. The folks up in the city council got the idea that they were going to build a tunnel that connected a bunch of fallout shelters under the city. That old Head Start building used to be an elementary school. One of the shelters was built right there in the basement. My husband Percy worked on the digging crew. He would come home telling me stories about how they had tunneled from the elementary school all the way to the train depot over on 3rd Avenue. And then one day, people stopped worrying about the bombs and the city stopped working on the tunnels. Percy got a job with the city working on the roads. The shelters were still there. But people just didn't care for it anymore. And that is of course until... And they found all the bodies. And Grams paused for a moment and then continued. We had been telling the police for weeks that someone had been going around snatching up our kids. But back then, no one really cared what happened to a bunch of colored kids. It was only when the mayor's daughter went missing that the police started looking into it. Three or more white kids went missing in a week and one of the mothers described a tall black man running off into the elementary school. The police searched every inch of that building and when they found nothing, they went down into the basement and found the door to the tunnel standing wide open. Less than an hour later, they were calling in every available officer. They had found 15 kids torn to shreds in the fallout shelter. Some of them looked like they had been in there for months. One of them, the last girl to be taken, was still breathing when they found her. She pointed into the tunnel and let out a little whimper of a scream before passing away right then and there. Grams took another swig of her flask and coughed again before she adjusted herself in her seat and leaned forward. The police didn't waste any time rounding up every tall black man in the city looking for someone to pin the murders on. They eventually settled on Alton Park. Alton was kind of slow, but he was also the janitor at the school. His trial lasted less than one day and he was sentenced to hang. He was dead within the week. Beatrice Stone stood outside the courthouse screaming to anyone who would listen about how Alton was innocent. She screamed that he wasn't tall enough and how the man who had took her daughter had skin as black as pitch. Not brown like me or Q. She spent the next few years in a sanitarium before her family finally brought her home. I think she's still up in Springhaven nursing home to this day. She doesn't talk anymore. People say that she just sits there and stares at the window. I was more than a little stunned by her story, but something wasn't sitting right with me. I paused for a moment after she finished and I said, How is this going to save our lives? Graham sighed and said, I was getting to that, son. I gripped my backpack a little tighter as she said, about 10 years later, some kids went missing. Once again, they were found in the elementary school. Once again, they pinned it on someone slow. 
We knew the cops weren't going to help us, so when it came for the winter about 10 years later, we all took shifts watching our kids. Q's mother was around 5 or 6 back then. Percy was sitting in the bedroom with our oldest son James, taking turns staring out the window and holding the shotgun. Mabel, Q's mother, and her brother Ozzy were in the bed when the creature came. Percy said that it almost looked like a shadow at first. Jesse was holding the shotgun and fired directly into its chest. It let out a blood-curdling howl. Jesse and Mabel screamed and went to the floor. The creature reached in and grabbed James by the arm and threw him into the wall hard enough to knock him out cold. Percy went for the gun and I was already bringing it up when I reached in and I grabbed Jesse. Mabel was sitting there on the floor when that damn thing poked its head down and sniffed her before turning and looking at Jesse. He reached for him just in time for Percy to reload the shotgun and fire a spray of buckshot directly into the thing's face. It howled as it jumped out of the window and into the night. Grams took the flash and passed it to Deontay saying, Drink up son, you too Francis. Deontay took a swig and gag before passing it to me. I took a sip and felt it burning as it slid down my throat. Grams took her flask back and said, Jesse was the sweetest little boy you'd ever met. Mabel was a little troublemaker though. After talking to Ethel Pearson at church, we heard how twin girls were sleeping in the same bed when it took one and left the other. She cursed under her breath and said that she watched it look away from the surviving girl in disgust. Apparently the leftover girl had just been caught stealing from her mother's purse that day. Deontay interrupted and said, It only takes the good kids, right? Grams patted Deontay on the head and said, That's my smart boy. Now don't go and set a church on fire or anything, but make sure you do at least one thing every day that would get you in trouble if you got caught. I skipped church the next day and I walked up to Springhaven. After showing the nurse at the front desk my Bible and claiming that I had come to minister to the elderly, she let me in with a smile. Grams had said that the woman's name was Beatrice Stone. I walked the hallways for a bit, stopping in a few rooms to talk about Jesus so not to raise any suspicion before seeing the name. B. Stone, outside of a room and fighting an elderly woman sitting in a chair staring out of the window. I sat down next to her and I opened my Bible saying, Mrs. Stone, my name is Francis Colley. She didn't so much as blink in response. I continued, I know this is going to sound strange, but I have a question for you about the thing that took your daughter. Her face shifted to a stern expression, and her eyes shot towards my direction while her face remained in the general direction of the window. Did it have blue eyes? I said as I realized I was being more than a little inconsiderate for perhaps the first time that morning. Beatrice coughed and said in a quiet voice, His teeth were like knives. She turned to me and said, How did you ever get close enough to see it, boy? I told her about the alley and how it had licked me. She grabbed me by the wrist and said, How did you get out alive when my baby died? What makes you so special? I didn't have an answer for her beyond what Gramps had said the night before. I stammered out the words. It only takes the good kids. The elderly woman jumped from her chair and pummeled me with a quickness I had not expected from a woman pushing 80. I screamed in pain as she raked her nails across my face. As the orderlies were pulling me off of her, she screamed, If it won't kill you, I will. I had to call my dad up to the nursing home and I fed him a line about how I was evangelizing to the sick and elderly when the woman attacked me. I showed up to school the next day with stitches on my forehead and cheek. Deontay asked what had happened and I lied saying that I got into a fight with a high schooler. He laughed and said, Yeah, and last night I plowed Cindy Crawford. We both laughed and went to class. Stephanie was waiting for us outside after the bell rang at 3. When the school bus pulled onto my street, there were police cars everywhere. We all stepped off a bit early as the bus backed off of my street and took an alternate route. The closer I got to my house, the more I started to feel the sickness in the pit of my stomach. My worst fears were realized when I saw that the window to Alan's room had been obliterated. Becky the caretaker sat in the back of an ambulance as paramedics bandaged her hands and face. 
My father was shouting at the police only to stop mid-sentence and run over to me. He picked me up into the kind of hug I hadn't experienced since kindergarten. He held me and cried as he said, We're gonna find your brother, okay? He put me down and I pushed past him into the house. No one seemed at all interested in my room, and I dumped the books out of my backpack. Before stuffing it with road flares, a flashlight, some extra batteries, and the gun I had stolen from my dad's safe. I stormed outside and I marched up to the nearest cop saying, You know damn well that my brother's gonna end up in that freaking preschool. Just grab some men and go down there already. The officer shot me an annoyed look and said, You should watch your language, kid. I looked up at him and I said, Fuck you. If you aren't gonna do anything to save Alan, then I will. He turned back to his colleagues and I stared off down the road as Deontay and Stephanie followed me asking where I was going. It didn't eat the bad kids. Alan was kicked out of school for eating up other students. It didn't grab him because it was hungry. I knew beyond knowing that it had grabbed him to punish us for bothering it. As I approached the abandoned Head Start building, Deontay stopped me in my tracks and said, Damn it, Francis, stop. I stopped and he continued, What do you think you're going to do to that thing? I pulled the gun from my bag and I pulled back the slide before saying, I'm going to kill it. Deontay and Stephanie took a step back before Stephanie said, Do you have another one of those? I shook my head and she said, Well, what do you have? I passed out the flashlight and a few road flares as we made our way into the abandoned preschool. Most of the glass in the doors had been busted out years before I was born. The city had boarded the place up, but there was a small window that still had glass and that's where we broke in. Once we were inside, the smell hit us immediately. The whole building smelled like raw sewage. Stephanie coughed and said, We should probably follow the smell. I nodded and in a few minutes, we found a doorway leading down into what looked like a basement. Stephanie turned the flashlight on and I took point as we moved down the stairs. We walked across the basement and toward the open hole in the wall that led to the tunnel. A heavy iron door lay rusted on the ground directly across from us. I could hear a quiet whimpering from inside. We rushed inside and that's when the flashlight caught Alan's leg just above us. The thing had impaled him on a piece of rebar that had been bent down from the crumbling concrete ceiling. Alan whimpered some more as if he hadn't even noticed us. Deontay dropped a road flare in the tunnel behind us. It gave off a hiss before giving us a bit more light to work with. Alan was too high up for any of us to pull him down. I turned to Stephanie and I said, Run upstairs and get help. She nodded and turned to go, but when we saw it, the creature stood in the red light of the flare. It was covered in a slimy liquid and had to crouch in the tunnel. It leaned on its long arms and smiled as it stared directly at me. Deontay popped into the road floor and held it in front of him as I pulled the pistol and proceeded to empty the magazine into its torso. I immediately realized my mistake. None of us had brought earplugs and the deafening sound of gunshots left us disoriented and unable to hear each other. The creature shook off the bullets and grabbed Stephanie by the face with its massive hand. Before I could load the next magazine into the gun, I was hit by the creature as it used Stephanie as a flail and knocked me to the ground. Deontay pushed the flare into the creature's arm, and it recoiled in pain before closing its hand into a fist and punching him so hard that his head looked like it had been crushed with a sledgehammer. With one friend dead at my feet and another being used as a weapon to pummel me into the ground, I had all but resigned myself to the fact that I was going to die. As I laid there broken, the creature laughed and said, There's no such thing as heroes, kid in a voice that sounded like someone was playing a recording of James Earl Jones through a speaker made of gravel. I held on to Stephanie as it moved deeper into the tunnel, laughing the whole time. I couldn't move. My arms and legs were useless. Slowly but surely, the road flare burned out. I lay there watching Alan whimper until the flashlight started to dim. As the last of the light left the crumbling fallout shelter, I noticed that my little brother had gone completely still. Left alone in the darkness, I eventually passed out. My father says that the police had found me and Alan after about a day of searching. I woke up in the hospital in a full body cast. They never found Stephanie. 
Deontay's body was laid to rest a few days later. I wasn't able to make the funeral. It wasn't long until the city filled the tunnel with concrete. I have no idea if the dark man was inside, but given that kids still go missing in that town every 10 or so years, I'm going to assume that it found a new place to set up shop. After I was well enough to walk on my own, my dad took a job in a neighboring state and we moved. I'm pushing 40 these days and I have a few kids of my own. It might sound strange, but as soon as we were old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, I encouraged them to do bad things every now and then. It might not make me the best parent in the world, but then again, nothing has ever tried to snatch them up. It only eats the good kids, but it has no problem with killing the bad ones. I still have no idea why it left me alive.